Okay, and you're live. Hi everybody, I'm Jack Rudlow. I'm the president of Gulf Specimen Marine Laboratory here in Tennessee, of Florida. And I have with me today, uh, Joel Satori from National Geographic, who is the, uh, the creator and the developer, everything else, of the photo arc that she's going to talk about, which is taking pictures of multiple creatures from all over the world. And uh, he comes to Gulf Specimen from time to time, and Joel will tell you why. Yeah, hi everybody. Joel Sartori here, Geographic Photo Arc. Behind me is a typical setup for uh, photographing animals, uh, tabletop sized animals at least, small ones. I've come to Gulf Specimen because they have an amazing collection of animals that range from from charismatic fish and eels all the way down to tiny little worms that live inside inside wood, barnacles, sponges, all sorts of marine invertebrates, and those count too. Most of the time, we think of biodiversity as lions and giraffes, and that's true, but you know, the, the small creatures literally run the world and allow us to live ourselves. The, the tiniest creatures are the ones that support all of us. They support all living on us. That's the base of the food chain. So, Whenever I come here, I, I get dozens of new species into the photo arc, and so that's why I'm here. All right. We're going to start with some questions um, some of the audience have been asking us. Um, the first one is for you, Joel, um, and it also could be for Jack because I know both of you have uh, worked for Nat Geo. Um, it's how did you start your career working for Nat uh, National Geographic, and do you have any advice for some of the younger fans out there who would like to follow in your footsteps? I started my career with National Geographic in about 1990, 91, and um, I started out by photographing kind of general interest stories, human interest stories for the magazine, and eventually just went to conservation stories, and then about 14, 15 years ago, I started shooting pictures for the photo arc, which is animals on black and white backgrounds telling their stories. So Jack, how did you get started? Okay, Ann and I did our first article for National Geographic on the Suwannee River in 1975. So we've been at this for a while. We did four, four articles over the years, and um, you know, Joel has done many, many more, but we got a pretty good taste of what it is to work with National Geographic, working with photographers, working with writers, editors, and that sort of thing learned a great deal of it, but um, it's one of those organizations that sort of uh, imprint on you for life and changes your life and you sort of become part of it and it becomes part of you and then, you know, things move on. So uh, I'm glad to see Joel is in there and in fact, uh, I think one of our, one of the issues we did, we both had, we had a, a story in the same issue, I forget which one, Chapalai or something like the that. Sea Turtles. Sea Turtles, sea it turtles. was the Sea Turtles one, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was the last one that Ann and I did. Yeah. So, you know, sea turtles were a big part. Bill Kurt Singer, so That's right. Yeah, yeah. Bill was a photographer. Yeah. Do you have any advice for some of the young people that are watching that wants to be a wildlife photographer? Advice for somebody who's watching wants to be a wildlife photographer. Well, it's it's always difficult. Always has been. Maybe a little more difficult now that so many people have good cameras and even their phones are excellent cameras. I guess I would suggest people should specialize, should really become, just work on one topic or issue or species or place, something they're very passionate in, something they love, something they want to save or make better, and then work on that for years and years. Become the go-to person for that topic. And then that, that to me is the path for longevity. Like I specialize in animal species, especially American endangered species. That's kind of my thing. And, um, uh, you know, it's just something that, that uh, I think over time, patience pays, but it is, it's hard to do it, to make a living in wildlife photography because so many people want to do it. So just, just become really good at a certain part of it. Have the world come to you for your expertise. Perseverance is what it's all about, and the ability to take lots and lots of rejections but still bounce back on there, and then eventually, I guess, they get tired of saying no to you if you're really good and then they'll start start to give you a chance. And that's the way it really happened with us in National Geographic. You know, when they, they, uh, I was the out of my first book, The Sea Brings Forth, got good reviews and I got a note from one of the editors and we had lots of meetings and things and it amounted to 
nothing. And then one day the phone rang and said, can you be down on the Swanee River uh, tomorrow? And that's the way it started. So, uh, but you have to be there and you can't just, uh, can't give up when they say no. Okay, we have a question from Maddie Kitchen. She, uh, she wants you to know, Joel, that she's a big fan of your work. And um, she wants, she, her question for you is, um, what are some ways the average citizen can help conserve species? Do you think it's a matter of creating wildlife corridors or planting native species in our yards? Or will it take drastic efforts like tearing down strip walls and reforesting? Maddie, that's a good question. I think it takes, it takes lots of uh, different initiatives to try to save species. Everything from saving their habitat to restoring their habitat to captive breeding. In some places, anti-poaching patrols like rhino and elephant anti-poaching patrols in Africa, Asia. Um, but it also takes common things we can do around the house, like reduce what we buy, recycle what we buy, and reuse what we buy. Um, drive a smaller car and drive it less. Insulate your home to keep all that carbon from going away, you know, and heating the earth. It's all these things we can do. Planting a pollinator garden at home. Oh, here's a good one. Quit pouring poisons on your lawn. Yep. You pour fertilizer, you pour insecticide, you, you, you pour herbicide on your lawn, it ends up in the water, and we drink that. Not to mention all the damage it does to wildlife. So the ornamental lawn, just the green lawns that people have, that's got to change the native vegetation and no more pouring chemicals on it. And not watering it, not irrigating it is a big deal too. It takes fossil fuel to bring water to your house. So why, why do that? Why pump treated water on your lawn? Plant native vegetation and you'll be fine. But really how you spend your money is how to save the world and tell other people, you know, this is how you feel, vote accordingly. And don't buy products that tear the world down. This takes you, this will take some education on your part, but you can do it. And it's fun and it makes you money. Be, being green makes you money. Jack, do you have anything to add to that? Well, the fertilizer is one of the big problems that are there, and uh, and people do basically water their lawns. But things like herbicides that are being sprayed by the power uh, companies, you know, they just go along the road and they have tankfuls of poisons, which they're dousing, you know, the uh, the whole the whole coastal area along, and cutting trees. Stop cutting trees, you know. The developers are really not your friends, the ones that are pushing down forest and they're pushing out wildlife. This is really ultimately the enemy because that causes all the development. The development causes overpopulation. Overpopulation causes pollution. Microplastics, I mean, oh God, even our aquarium, every place is out there. Our bloodstream is filled with microscopic filaments of plastic. So every time you take a bottle of bottle water and you drink it and you toss it away, that's coming back to haunt us sooner or later. And we're going to have to really learn to be green and, and put down these so-called conveniences that we have. They're not conveniences because you end up in the hospital with all kinds of needles and things put in you and cancers and diseases and spend you know your whole life savings paying for the poisons and the pollutions that the corporations are shoving down our throats. So yes, there are things we can do, but we have to get busy and do them. Look, there's, there, we're on our way to 10 or 11 billion people, and all those people, they want a quality of life like, like we have in the US, and I get that. But if we are not smarter about what we do, we are really gonna be in trouble. We have to save giant chunks of habitat to regulate the air and water we breathe, especially to regulate the rainfall cycles. So it is really complicated, and big corporations do great things. I want to stress that. Some of them do great things. Some do. Some do. So we yep. have to we have to just start doing things smarter. If one thing's for sure, I think Jack and I would agree on if we keep going exactly the way we've been going, we're we're gonna have a planet that's just ruined. There's going to be a lot of sick people, there's going to be more warfare, there's going to be more famine, more disease. It's not going to be pretty, but we can turn things around somewhat if we start to act now. That's a big answer to a short question, Maddie, but I thank you for your question. Okay, okay on a lighter note, um, Anki um, underscore 1007 asks, what's your favorite kind of animal species to photograph? My favorite type of animal to photograph is the next one. 
because I have to like them all, right? I have to like the sponge as much as I like the tiger or the zebra. So to me, I'm interested in all of them. I really am. Uh, Jordan Briskin asks, uh, why is the photo art compromised of only animals in captivity? <laughs> oh, why is the photo art com comprised of only animals in captivity? Because have you ever tried to photograph a tiger in the wild in the jungle using a studio setup? He's not going to come in and lay down on your black background and get lit up. That's kind of a smart aleck answer, isn't it? Mm -hmm. we, do, we do animals in human care because we can get more in a shorter amount of time and we work at, animal, at places where there's abundant attention and care, and it's just the way to go. If you had to try to photograph a cross-section of biodiversity across insects, reptiles, amphibians, fish, birds, and mammals in the wild, you would never get it done. You wouldn't get much done. So we're at more than 10,000 species now because we are working with animals that are in human care, like here at Delta uh, Morgan asks, um, have you ever dressed up like an animal to get a good picture without scaring them? Have I ever dressed up like an animal to get a good picture without scaring them? When I was doing field work, we would get into hides or blinds to photograph parrots or to photograph uh, what it, whatever it was, you know, that we were trying to get pictures of, California condors. So we would hide, but I've never dressed up like an animal to get close to an animal. Okay, on that note, um, Leslie, um, she asked, um, she says, I know you started this project because your wife was ill and you need it to be close to home. Do you miss, do you miss those field assignments that Gio was famous for? I do not miss the field assignments. I don't. They're a lot of work. Uh, and uh, I did that for a long time. I did that for like 17 years and 30 stories. So I, I did that. You know, I, I like the fact that the photo art seems to have people's attention more so than when I worked on magazine stories. And I love National Geographic Magazine, totally. And these photo art pictures become National Geographic Magazine stories. So it's good. It's just fine to do it this way, I think. It's a different way of approaching stuff. Yeah, let me say something on that too, is that what Joel does is unique by showcasing this animal against black and white. So let's say you're looking at your tiger. I mean, I've seen a tiger once in a while, just uh, you know, up, uh, in Malaysia. And uh, I saw a flash of orange, a blink, or whatever. Even if we ran the tiger down, or take any of these creatures here, if we take these things and I put them in a habitat, whatever we shot today, whether it was the fish or the worms or whatever, they would black, the background would become the story as well. The animal is there, but the animal is minimized. It's, it's shrunken. So the whole business of seeing eyeball to eyeball, this diversity, this shape, this form, this color, and of course it's, it's much more interesting if they have eyes to look back at you, but a lot of these things don't have eyes, but they're still fascinating creatures. And what Joel does is he basically, as I say, showcases, but puts it together, makes it visible in a unique way. So it takes zoos, it takes aquariums, it takes nature centers, it takes all of these places. And sometimes he has to travel long distances, like when, last night, for example, you were here, and we were shooting all day yesterday, and you ended up in Monticello to do what? I photographed the Hornbill at the North Florida Wildlife Center yesterday, it was a nice place, and uh, Got back here about 10.30 at night and we started again this morning. But, yeah. you know, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not the first to do portraits of animals on black and white, and I won't be the last, but I'm pretty type A. And yeah. so we have quite a few. And and really, um, we wanted to start doing this now rather than wait until a lot of these animals become very, very rare, hard to find, if not extinct. So, there you go. Okay, we have a question from Elizabeth Fry. She asks, do you have any advice for people get it, just getting started in wildlife photography as a hobby? Wildlife photography is a hobby. Keep your day job or stay yep. with your parents if they're paying your bills because it's really, it, it's not easy to make a living in wildlife photography. National Geographic grant funds the photo work and so we're very thankful for that. Um, there's, there's not a lot of um, markets for wildlife photos anymore because there's more than a billion pictures a day of pictures posted on the web. You can't, and they're free. So how do you compete with that? I don't think you do. 
I think you just try to do good work that helps tell good stories, get the world interested, do the right thing. That's about it. But in terms of making a living in wildlife photography and how to get started, find something you're passionate about and work on that for a lot of years and don't give up. That's the thing. Become an expert. Let me say something on that. Okay, there's the issue of making a living, and that's always a struggle, and I won't really address that, but I want to say that if you're looking on the web, and you're looking on YouTube, and you look at, there's some of the most incredible wildlife pictures that people have been taking around the world, little scenarios. I mean, something of a, like, you know, uh, I saw one of a crow uh, pushing a hedgehog off the road so it wouldn't get run over. I mean, there's all this bits of stuff. That's cool. When you get a cool picture like that, and you get something, forget the money. Just think about people looking at it all different places and looking at this thing and saying, wow. And this connects a cosmic um, connection or association that these are not animals, black boxes and everything else. These are living as sentient beings that have their own energy, their own thoughts, their own, their own world. And thank God for the camera and for all this stuff and the, and, you know, the technology. I know the old-fashioned photographers are not real happy about that everybody's got these cameras, but we have, a, we have a billion eyes looking at all kinds of things, and if you get a good picture and you put it out there, and you put out something worthwhile, you've done a wonderful thing in my book. Right. I think this is actually the golden era for wildlife conservation because we can reach the whole world. That's right. In the old days, if we, wanted, if we were limited to just a print magazine, it would take up to a year to get a picture in print. Well, now if we see a problem or we want to celebrate somebody or some company that's doing great things, we can go directly to the world with that. So I wouldn't go back in time if I could. I, I really like the fact that the web can bring people together and, and alert us, educate us, educate us to the good and bad in terms of the environment. So it's really a good time to be doing the kind of work you love and that makes the world a better place, whether it's wildlife, social issues, whatever. And you can do it in your garden, you can do it in your bird bath, you can do it, you know, watching ants crawl yeah. along a sidewalk crack. You can work on getting your, your local town to quit pouring poisons on the side of the road in city parks. You can you can take over their recycling program or help steer them towards that. There's there's a thousand things you can do. If people have any questions, they can always contact me through joelsartori.com, joelsartori.com, and uh, ask away. We've got lots of answers. Question. How did both of you meet? Uh, I called Jack when I was in western, the western end of the Panhandle of Florida a few years ago. Told him who I was, that I was looking for a place like his that would have a lot of marine invertebrates. There was a little pause on the end of the phone, and he just said something like, how soon can you get here? Come on by, we'll take care of you. And he has ever since, so it's been great. I've got to tell you one part of that story. So he comes in. Late, we have a little apartment that we could uh, invited him to stay at. And uh, he got in around, I don't know, 11 30, 12 o'clock. So we walked the road and we walked down to the living dock. And I turned on the floodlights and we have this lift net there. Now, I haven't seen squid on that dock for about two years. You know, they just weren't there. You go out and look at everything else. So I'm sitting there, I'm showing Joel around like that, and I hit the button, it lifts it up, and the damn thing is full of squid. And they're beautiful, and he got these pictures of them, and we went, we scooped them up that night, brought them up to the lab, and shot the pictures the next morning, and we have them, you know, they're, they're in fact, one of them we made some big posters of, but that was that very magical night and very evening, and, and yeah. uh, we tried it right now, I promise you there would be no squid there right and now. And wasn't that our 4,000 species? Yeah, that was the 4,000, yeah. yeah, he was, I'm saying, yeah. he was trying to break 4,000, and that trip is, he, yeah, that he went over the hill and made the 4,000. So that's how we got together. Yeah. Okay, um, the one question is, um, how are things different uh, for the photo arc with COVID-19 and quarantine measures in place? Things are different with COVID-19 for the photo arc because we have to be safe. I, uh, I spent the past few months photographing insects in my home state of Nebraska. We got hundreds of species. But I thought before winter came, I would do one more trip. Well, one trip, this is my only trip really where I'm going to outside the state of Nebraska very far. Uh, besides one trip to Santa Fe this summer by myself to photograph insects, this is a chance to get things that I won't see in, in Nebraska at all in terms of Gulf of Mexico 
invertebrates. And uh, we're going to stop at a couple of zoos too and do safe distanced mask shoots outdoors only and head for home next week sometime. So it's, it's very different, very restricted, but it's okay. It gives me a chance to, to edit, get caught up on my editing. It's fine. It's all right. I just, I'm, I'm looking forward to people being able to get back to work and not suffering from the disease, obviously. But in terms of photo art personally, the photo art, we, we move on. We keep working. Okay, uh, we have our last question by Harper Bowley Jones. Um, he asks, um, what, bring you, what brings you joy in your everyday life? <laughs> Jack, what brings you joy in your everyday life? Walking in the woods on the St. Mark's National Wildlife Refuge. <laughs> and just uh, getting out there and walking along Pied Flats and uh, staying out of traffic in Tallahassee. Yes. That's good. For me, it's... Uh, I like working and I like getting uh, getting things done and adding to the photo work, obviously. And I also like, uh, I guess what brings me joy is um, I like to help other people. And uh, I like to be home and sleeping in my own bed because I haven't done that much in 30 years. So it's, again, the pandemic, it's been different, but parts of it, have, for me at least, have been okay in that regard. Is there anything else that uh, both of you would like to say before we end our live stream? I would like to say something. Okay. Come on down to Gulf Specimen and look around. It's really interesting. You can touch a lot of these animals, you know, starfish and crabs and all these things in these touch tanks. It's fun. It's family owned and operated. And I tell you, the, the education you get here on how, how the oceans work, how do you get seafood? It doesn't just happen. We're surrounded in here with Poster after poster, you can spend all day here reading and learning and seeing the stuff. To me, this is one of the key things going forward. If we want people to be connected with nature, they have to see how it moves in life, be able to touch it sometimes, listen to it if it's something that's terrestrial. This is the kind of place that keeps people connected to nature and it's great for kids too. So I would I'd have people come down. Is that how's that, Jack? Is that does that sound about love, right? I'd love to hear that. All right. And I also want to say that uh, you know, we have plans for the future, and going, we have been able to uh, get a donation from the Florida Phipps People Foundation to increase the land size. We have a grant that partially allows us to build a classroom there. We're going to have entertainment and education and everything else like that, but we are in dire need of funds to, uh, to, to make that actually happen. But we're like three quarters of the way there, and we need help with the rest of it. But for over the years, I really appreciate all the people that have put in support for Gulf Specimen. We're sitting right here in the Culpeper Pavilion. This was uh, a donation from Jim Culpeper uh, years ago. And, uh, you know, it was through this, I think, we could have never afforded it in the way we were doing it before. So we want the community to get behind us and, and the, the people that can really help out because we give good value for whatever dollars get invested, as you can see. Joel's here, and we've had scientists from all over the world come here. We've had naturalists and writers and artists and everything else like that. So we're part of the community, and we want you to be part of our community. So do come on down and join us and become a member of Bell Specimen. It's a great place. All right. Thank you.